just to kind of reiterate something I've said so many times from, from the pulpit that maybe I haven't said in a while, but it just struck me as TJ was leading us all before the throne of God in heaven above, I'm hearing kid noise while we're praying. And that is such a blessing. It is such a blessing. The children are a blessing in our midst. They're not a curse. And um, now, again, I want to reiterate, obviously, you know, if little Johnny is getting too far out of hand, it may be time to take the walk of shame. Go help Johnny adjust. Come back, try it again. And sometimes, sometimes we grown-ups, we know, we understand. Kids just have bad days. Sometimes it's just, it's just <laughs> It just ain't working today. That's why we have the rooms, the nursery room across, across the way. That There's TVs in there, and uh, hopefully they're at a volume that, that you, can, you can hear. But the aim is to have them here in us. We're talking, as Pastor Nate has already revealed, our, our focus this morning uh, is on the necessity and privilege of, of Christian evangelism. And listen to me. Listen, listen, listen. Or what I'm saying about your children being with us, being in here, being a blessing. The very first mission field of any father or mother is in your home. Is with your own children. That's your first mission field. And I can tell you with over 20 years as a youth pastor, following all of the traditional youth ministry stuff trying to work with children's ministries, with children's pastors stuff, I can tell you, I'll say that, I've said it a thousand times, I'll continue to say it. I know by experience, we could create Disney World back there, the best that they got or had before late, of late, have the most dynamic personality back there. Doing all the greatest jazzed up stuff. And I can tell you through experience and empirical evidence there is absolutely nothing we could ever do in a children's area that's going to have the long-lasting impact of your children actually being in here with you as the Word of God is being preached and sung and them seeing you, Mom and Dad, open the Word of God, seeing you, Mom and Dad, praying and saying you singing, hearing you singing. Now, if you're sitting out there and you're not singing, shame on you. Because this isn't supposed to be a performance up here. This right up here is supposed to be nothing more than a guide to us. But the scripture is clear that when the church comes together, we are supposed to collectively together sing with one another psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Not be entertained. It is an act of worship. And I want to encourage you moms and dads too. I know, I know, I know that you worry. And I love it. I love the fact that I got moms and dads that are just sometimes so wound up about their kid being the, the total distraction in, in the worship service. Again, you know where the line is crossed to handle it. But again, kid noise, rustling of some pages, coloring, playing with a little silent rolling Tonka toy truck. Not one that's going to click, 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 click. No, don't bring those, please. It's a blessing. That is, a, that is life, man. Those children are life in our midst. Joy. And moms and dads, hear me. Trust me, hear me. That window, it's just, this is just a season. That window closes rapidly. You feel like right now, oh, man, I'm going to be dealing with this forever. You are not going to be dealing with this forever. In terms of trying to train them in how to behave in such settings, this is, it's, a, it's a short window. I'm telling you. Pretty soon you're going to be looking out at your son who's 38 years old and looking at his kids and going, that, that was him just about two months ago. Anyway, that was for free. Hopefully my time clock didn't stop before now. I mean, start before now. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, as always, please open them to Romans chapter 10. Picking up kind of where we left off, right? really kind of overlapping a little bit. And so I want us to read, as you see there, verses 10, 12 to 17. Beginning in verse 12, 
For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. But who, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? And how will they preach unless they are sent, just as it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who proclaim good news of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. As I've already shared, I have titled this morning's message, The Necessity and Privilege of Christian evangelism. Now, I know that this is an area of our Christian faith that is, in my experience, in our context, one of the most, again, if not the most feared and most misunderstood aspects of living as a disciple of Jesus Christ in this world. And it's feared for, for, for a multitude of reasons. One is that on the surface level, we tend to fear the possible outcome of being perceived by either the person we're we're engaging in the conversation with or those that are around us as being some you know religious nut you know hearing this and boy this is some fanatic religious nut out here again uh, you know all, all all of this um because they may perceive that and a lot of times if that is a it is that if that is going on in someone's heart and mind they're seeing you hearing you condemning them and everybody else in the world to hell, right? Isn't that what we're kind of afraid of being perceived of? Is that we're condemning everyone? And listen to me, I want to be clear about this. If we are declaring the true gospel of Scripture regarding Jesus Christ, we are, in fact, telling them that unless your faith is completely and wholly in Jesus Christ and what he did, you are going to hell. And so is everyone else who is not. We shouldn't back up from that. And I get the concern. I really do, because it does happen from time to time. I've experienced it. Where Most of the time it's not the person I'm talking to. It's in the body language of the people that are, that are in earshot of, of the conversation. A lot of times I have, I, I have you know, detected just a discomfort with the conversation. But more times than not, it's either neutral, way more times than not. But what I have also detected so many times, <laughs> it's almost comical, kind of almost distracting in the conversation. People within earshot are straining to listen. So I know in the moment that what I'm sharing with this person I'm trying to be very clear because I know this guy is listening over here or this lady is listening over here. They've looked at that blouse 13 times in the whole, whole point of the time I'm in the conversation. Rena may be going around looking at stuff shopping because that's what she does, you know, when she goes. I don't know if you guys have figured this out maybe with your wives. I learned that you go into a department store, whatever, and whatever clothing rack she went to first, just hang out right there because she'll be back several times, right? I can just hang out right there. If anybody's there and I can get in a conversation, it's, uh, I can have a gospel conversation. When, especially when a woman is still hanging around the same rack when I'm in this conversation with this person, she's listening. She's wanting to listen. So another fear of embracing the call from Scripture to evangelize the world that we live in stems from the fear that if we look too intently, honestly, at the Great Commission that we see in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20, if we look at that and agree that Jesus did in fact say what he said about making disciples of all nations, we fear that if we really, if we really agree with that, we really look intently at that, that we might find ourselves being sent somewhere overseas, right, to some jungle in Africa or something. So I don't, really don't want to give too much assent to that because we fear it. It's like trying to ignore something, expecting it to go away by benign neglect. It just, you know, I'm just going to ignore it, and it, it'll just go away. It doesn't go away because it's there. It's there. Now, you may be saying, well, Jeff, if I'm buying into that and I'm sharing the gospel in a local church and locally, 
community, and that's, that's really who we'll see in Scripture as to who God actually sends. It's not somebody who's not doing it here, and then he, and then he sends them out there to do what they won't do here, do there. That doesn't, that's, not how we, that's not what we see in Scripture. And you may be sitting there going, okay, well, if that's the pattern, then that's all the more reason for me not to share the gospel openly in public here because then I don't want him sending me out there. I want to kind of, let's dismiss all that. Let's get rid of that right here. I have personally never known not a single foreign missionary who had not had placed in their hearts by God an intense desire to go to a particular place to a particular people, and, and, and with that, a special love for those people and that culture, which is why they were being sent. I have never personally known a Jonah whom God said to go to a certain people, and he loathed the idea of going to that certain people and tried to go the other way. He ends up there anyway. It didn't, it's not going to ever work out, right, to run from it. But I've never known a Jonah personally. Again, Every single person I've ever known who's ever gone off into a foreign mission field couldn't help but going. They wanted to go. They just couldn't get, they couldn't get past it. They love those people. Even though they might be acknowledging that they're going to be missing the conveniences of what we experience here in our American culture, even missing family and friends, the, the call is greater in them not outside of them. It's just something the Holy Spirit will do in them to go to a foreign mission field. So let's don't fear that. Don't fear that. I'm telling you, if, if God is intending to call you to a foreign mission field, it's going to be the joy of your heart, the passion of your heart to go. You're going to have that. It's not going to be something you're going to do without in your life. So don't, let's not worry about that kind of, let's, let's, Let's take that out of Satan's hand. I like to, anytime I sense an opposition, I like to disarm them. And this is one we need to disarm him with. Listen to me. Again, if we think about this, we really think about this. We're gathered here this morning. There are others that are watching online, gathered as they can in the moment. If, we, if everything we pray, read, teach, and sing about when we come together as a church isn't true, about the gospel of Jesus Christ and what he's done, what he's doing, and what he will do, then what in the world are we doing? Paul, even in 1 Corinthians 15, talking about the resurrection, which is part of the gospel. It is the good news. It is that if Christ be not raised, if there's no resurrection, we of all people are most to be pitied. What in the world are we doing? We might as well, as he says, live, eat, and drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. There's no point. And if it is true, and it is, then how can we not desire for everyone we see to hear and know what we have heard and know? How can we not? How much do we have to hate a person to be okay with them not hearing the gospel message and, them, and, and seeing them go to hell. Listen, whether they get saved or not, that's not, our, that's, not, we're, that's not within our power. We have seen already Paul declaring the sovereignty of God in salvation, the absolute unmistakable sovereignty of God in salvation, right? But we are the instruments he has chosen to bring his gospel message through. And we only have, there's only one hope. There's no other hope for anyone, anywhere, at any time. I do pray. I do pray that we as a church will have the blessing of continuing. We have had the joy of seeing it. We've already experienced it. And I'm having, I'm praying constantly, God, please allow us the blessing of continuing to see more and more and more people locally and then in other parts of our nation, and then other parts of the world, come to faith in Christ through the work of the Holy Spirit, working through us, the people of the Shepherd's Church, specifically, particularly us, in bringing this good news of great joy 
to a lost world around us. Would it not then be an incredible, if we do this, if, if we continue to grow as we have, we continue to, to avail ourselves to be used by God to bring this gospel message into our realms of influence. And as I look around this room, there are so many realms of influence that overlap, and yet none of them are, are uniquely and exclusively combined one with another. Even husbands and wives have different realms of influence, though their realms of influence overlap. If we do that, would it not be an incredible, again, an amazing blessing as a church to see the evidence in some of our members' lives that they are clearly being called to the foreign mission field beyond our borders and then that we as a church would actively support in letting them go, and sending them. If we truly take into account that the real need for every human being in this world is not better politics, it's not better economics, it's not better water or better technology or better medicine. As necessary as all those things are, and they are not to be neglected, but when we realize that the real need and the real means of real change in this world is hearts that are changed and transformed by the Holy Spirit through the gospel that we proclaim, we will have a greater passion for its proclamation anywhere and everywhere. And we'll have greater confidence, boldness in that. Again, this is one of those things it, it behooves us as Christians to meditate on. To sit and think about what God did in saving us. Again, thinking about what he did, what he saved us from. If we're truly honest with the state of our hearts and minds and lives before our salvation. Being honest with that. Not thinking too highly of ourselves. We'll come to a confident belief that whomever we're talking with, my God can save that person. And if you're sitting within the sound of my voice and you're thinking that you, 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 you would really like to become more engaged as an evangelistic Christian, a major confidence booster is given to us right here in this text in verses 12 and 13. Play, pay attention to the universal appeal of the gospel in verses 12 and 13 of our text here. He says, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. First of all, it doesn't matter what their ethnicity or nationality or financial or social status or even their moral reputation is. Everyone we know needs the Savior, Jesus Christ, and God will save from every tribe and every nation and every people and every language, as, Re as Revelation tells us. So step one is to know that this gospel proclamation is for everyone, everywhere, no matter who they are, and that there is no partiality with God based on any of our categorical designations. He doesn't, he doesn't work according to us. He works through us. So we never know when we're sharing the gospel with someone whether the person's heart to whom we are speaking is going to be opened to hear and receive that message. But we do know that there is nothing that our eyes and our mind can conceive or perceive in them or about them that prevents them from coming to faith in Christ if the Holy Spirit is in fact opening their eyes to see and ears to hear. Whatever we may perceive as a barrier, and men are, listen, I have, oh, golly, I've been so guilty of this in my, in, in my life before, and I know that it just, it, it, it's consistent with most Christians. And that is that we tend to pre-qualify people as to whether they're actually ready to hear. We tend to, we tend to analyze their lives 
to see, okay, are they, are they, re- they're not ready yet. They're not ready yet. Who do we think we are? Think about this, let's think. We're telling God then we know better than he. We're also telling God that their circumstances are more powerful than his work in their heart and their mind. That he can't overcome that. I want to bring up Paul again, the one writing this letter. When was he converted? On the road to Damascus to do what? To continue ravaging the church of Jesus Christ. That was his whole intent. And right in the midst of that, Jesus Christ converts the man. It's a work of God. It is not of us at all. Look look at what Luke Luke recorded about the report from Paul and Barnabas after they had returned from their first missionary journey to the church from which they had been sent out on their first missionary trip again. In Acts chapter 14, verse 27, and we're going to be looking a lot in Acts. Luke records, and when they, Paul and Barnabas, had arrived back in Antioch, and gathered the church together, they began to report all the things, all things that God had done with them and how He had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. On Paul's second missionary journey, we find him in Philippi. And, 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 and look at what is recorded in that account of, of Luke's in Acts chapter 16 at what happened there. It says there, and a woman named Lydia... From the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening. Look at this. Whose heart the Lord opened. Not Paul. Whose heart the Lord opened to pay attention to the things spoken by Paul. He's writing even from prison to the Colossian church, if you recall. He's already a prisoner of, of, of Christ, really in the Roman prison system. And in Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 through 4, Paul implores them, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well. That what? That God will open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak the mystery of Christ for which I have also been bound, that I may make it manifest in the way I ought to speak. We see the disposition of Paul's heart in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16. I didn't put this in the slides. Forgive me for that. That slipped me. Where he says, Therefore, I am, for if I proclaim the gospel, I have nothing to boast, for I am under compulsion. For woe is me if I do not proclaim the gospel. Now, the thing is there, again, is he praying for them to pray for him? He's asking them to pray for him that, that God would open a door, and he's wanting to know how he ought to speak. Right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16, where he talks about, woe is me if I don't proclaim the gospel, we're going to see here that there is a, there's one word, keruso, which is, is a, a, an official proclamation, which is the word applied to actual preaching, as what I'm doing up here right now. And then there's the euangelizomai, which is where he talks about here, and that is just sharing the good news. Sharing the good news. That's what woe is me. Not if I don't preach the gospel, but that if I don't pray, proclaim it in sharing it in whatever way. Now that can include preaching, but it actually includes all, even just conversational sharing of the gospel message. That's what he was saying here. Woe is me if I don't do that. My suspicion is that for a great number of us sitting here today, the barrier to actively sharing the gospel is not really the fear of being perceived in a bad light or even mistreated, persecuted, but the fear of failure, right, in sharing the gospel. Notice what Paul was praying there, that God would open the door and that the Lord would make sure he says what he ought to say the way he ought to say it. He's not worried about failure or not. 
But we cannot control whether or not, again, the person to whom we are speaking will or will not receive this message in faith. And we have to, we, we have to rid ourselves of carrying the load of responsibility that when we have truly declared the true gospel according to the word of God, we haven't added to, we haven't taken away. We just shared the word of God, what it says with them if they do not receive the message we have not failed we that is nor nor if they do receive the message have we then succeeded we assume too much about ourselves this is a work of god in his plea to the colossians paul was asking not only for an open door to proclaim God's word, but he was also asking for prayer that he would keep in line with God's word when he was speaking. What, look, what he says there in verse 4, that I may make it manifest in the way I ought to speak. The antecedent of, of, of it is the gospel, the word of the Lord. He is writing again, to remind you in that passage right there, when he's writing that letter, what, what maybe Paul is dealing with is the situation he's in, the circumstances he is facing. Because again, as I said a few moments ago, he's writing as a prisoner. He's writing as a prisoner for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So a temptation he may be facing there is that with his captors, he may fear saying something that provokes them because they can beat him at any moment or even put him to death. And he may be facing that kind of fear and he's asking again for him not to back down but to speak the true word of God, the gospel according to God, not one that he has pal made palatable to maybe his captors, those, those who have him in chains at the moment so that he might not face further persecution, further beating that he's already faced by this point in his life. He's wanting to speak the truth. We must trust God at his word, and we've got to trust God with his word. In Isaiah chapter 55, Verses 6 through 11, Isaiah records there, Seek Yahweh while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the right unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return to Yahweh, and he will have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares Yahweh. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bear and sprout and giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what pleases me and without succeeding in the manner for which I sent it. There is never a failure in proclaiming the gospel when we are declaring the true gospel of Christ, even when the person to whom we are speaking does not receive it. You do not fail. And we should see this implicitly in our own focal text stated in verse 16. There he says, however, admitting there, excuse me, did, they did not all heed the good news for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Spoken the truth, but they're not hearing it. So having given those words of confident assurance in verses 12 and 13, that this gospel message is for, for anyone from anywhere and from any background, Paul breaks out in a series of rhetorical questions beginning in verse 14. Look at verses 14 and 15. He says there, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him whom they have not heard? 
And how will they hear without a preacher? And how will they preach unless they are sent? Let me stop right there. In keeping our understanding of the context of this letter and what Paul is still arguing, we need to keep in mind that the antecedent to the word they in these verses is specifically referring to the yet unbelieving Jews, specifically referring to them. As you will recall from the beginning of this very chapter, even the very beginning of chapter 9, 9, 10, and 11, all the same context there, but verse, verses 1 and 4, look, look up in, the, in your chapter there in your Bibles, verse 1, he says, Brothers, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them. Again, the context tells us who the them is. It's the unbelieving Jews. For their, self, is for their salvation. For I testify, testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. And remember we pointed out this epigenesco, genosco, is a real experiential knowledge. They don't have a real knowledge. For not knowing about the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. These Jews are trying to pursue righteousness by adhering to the law, something no human being has ever been able to do other than Jesus Christ himself. And instead of submitting themselves to His righteousness, they're trying to create their own, is what he's saying. So the specific reference in these verses in our text, and particularly here in verses 14 and 15, is that Paul is asking how these unbelieving Jews are going to call on him in whom they have not believed. But he is also, within the same context, asserting that the general application is universal, not just to the unbelieving Jews. Why do I say that? Because though he is specifically answering the matter of the Jews, those who, by all human perception, should be believing in this Jesus Christ, he he was the Jewish Messiah, still is. He's, 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 He's also brought in the fact of salvation extending to both Gentiles and Jews in verses 12 and 13. Did he not? So once again, it's important to see, and this is something Paul is bringing out, even in specificity in reference to the Jews, the unbelieving, the yet unbelieving Jews, the Gentiles have been brought into the conversation as well here in verses 12 and 13. But it's really important to see here again that the way of God in bringing salvation to anyone is the exact same for everyone, whether they are a Jew or a Gentile whether they're American or African or, or British or Russian, it doesn't matter. It's the same. It is the same. We cannot come up with a better plan for God. And oh my goodness, does not the evangelical church have a tendency to do that? We do stuff to try to make this palatable to a lost world. We do things in order to bring them in so that we can backdoor them with the gospel. Show me that. Show me that pattern anywhere in Scripture. It's not there. Paul begins in this rhetorical argument with the end, and he works his way backwards logically through a chain to the, to, to the beginning. <clears throat> Notice in verse 14, in the first question of this series of rhetorical questions, that what is explicitly given is that people don't call on the name of the Lord without believing first. Without believing first. The grammatical construction of this sentence dictates to us that where we have in our Bibles, most of our Bibles, in whom they have not believed, Paul is speaking specifically of believings in ter- believing in terms of committing oneself to the person of Christ. So before one calls on the name of the Lord, they are already in a state of believing in Him. In other words, when a person is at the point of confessing Jesus as Lord, as we see in verse 9 of this chapter, they are at that point in their hearts already in a state of committing themselves to Christ by faith, in faith. They are at that point 
believing in their hearts that he is Lord. And when they confess or call upon him, this is the evidence of the belief that is preceding the confession. Listen, when we see a, a, a light emanating from a light bulb, we know at least two things about that, right? That the filament inside that bulb is burning. We know that. And we also know that electricity is running through it, right? I mean, you don't have to be an electrician to know that. The light emanating from the burning filament is proof that the electricity is running through it. The filament can't burn unless the invisible electricity is there. But because the invisible electricity is there and running through the filament, the filament cannot not burn and emanate light. Now, I mean, some of you guys may say, well, I've seen a blown bulb. You know, you turn the switch on and it, it, it's a blown bulb. The electricity is not running through it. It's only running to it, to the break. It's not running to it. Stop arguing with me, David. In Paul's line of reasoning here, the one believing in Jesus will call on him. He has just declared that in verse 10 of this passage, has he not? Remember there, verse 10, for with the heart a person believes, leading to righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, leading to salvation. Remember last week that we saw that the connective conjunction and here used in this sentence does not allow the believing and the confessing to be disjointed. They are two sides of the one insane coin. You can't have one without the other. So he is asking the question, how shall or should or would, since it's a, it's, it's a um, subjunctive, they call on whom they have not believed. He is pressing as to how one is to think one comes to faith in Christ for salvation. And he answers that question by moving back up the chain of succession to the preceding link in the chain, which is the question, and how will they believe in him of whom they have not heard? We want him to come to Christ. Uh, we want him to confess him, call upon him. They got to believe in him. Well, how do they believe in him if they haven't heard, right? In case you haven't noticed in all of this, again, Paul is writing in such a logical manner as to leave no crack open for anyone to disagree with him. Everyone looking at this, reading this, hearing this would have to say, yeah, there's no denying the logical succession here. So in that, it would behoove us to kind of pick up what Paul is laying down as well. It's what he expected his readers then to do. It's what the Holy Spirit would expect us to do. In order to call, one has to believe. And in order to believe, one has to hear. These are the things he's laid down so far, right? But in this last phrase, he is beginning to bring things into a laser focus. And he does this by using a relative pronoun here translated in our text, in our English text, as of whom, which has sort of built into it syntactically uh, the, the, the demonstrative pronoun. It's what he's really kind of being, this one. He's pointing to the whom is referring to a specific this one. In other words, Paul is not leaving open what might seem to some readers a, a kind of fill in the blank, whomever you want to believe in, but a specific one, Jesus Christ himself. There's no other. There is no other. He, he would do this. Why? Because there is no other whereby one must be saved. As if you recall, Peter and proclaimed in uh, before the San, Sanhedrin in Acts chapter chapter four. It's just I love I love the book of Acts. In Acts chapter four, verses eleven and twelve, Peter declares, "He is the stone which was rejected by you." He's calling them out in their sin. The builders which became the chief cornerstone, and there is salvation in no one else. Now they've been threatened. We want you to stop preaching in this name. 
You can preach. You can't preach in this name anymore. What is he declaring? There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Paul is intimating this very same thing in this phrase in our focal text in Romans chapter 10. The next link in the chain is really interesting because of the implications that reach where many are not comfortable with going today. It has been somewhat of a popular movement. I've actually, I wanted to say this, it, it's really encouraging that I've seen it kind of tamped down of late. But there for a while, some of you that are old enough, we were seeing coming out of our Christian colleges and even seminaries, a real aversion to identify with a local body of, of believers. It was a it, it kind of a, it was a wild, wild west kind of thing. I was just going to start a church in my garage. And, you know, like they were a popular, you know, wanting to be a popular rock band or something. Um, this right here links everything to the local church. It links everything about the gospel proclamation to the local church. I want to explain why. He asks here, and how will they hear without a preacher? Again, what is interesting is that this word isn't just speaking of someone or anyone conversationally sharing the gospel, euangelizomai, like we like he talked about before. It's not that. He's using the word specifically that speaks of a preacher. Peruso. This word at that time was commonly used of an official herald of, say, a king a governor, a ruler of some sort, that herald is going out under the authority of that king, that ruler, that governor, and he's proclaiming a maybe an edict from that king or ruler of whatever sort. He's not speaking his own message. He is speaking particularly that which he was sent out to say. And he is doing so in an official manner to a broad audience. That's what this word means. Obviously, within the context of the Christian church to which Paul is writing here, this is a plain reference to the one preaching to the gathered church along with unbelievers in attendance. That did happen. That was happening and happens just like with us today. Preaching this official message of our King, Jesus. And speaking no other. Now we know from scripture and our own personal experience that it is not always within the context of a preacher preaching at a church gathering from a pulpit that someone comes to faith in Christ. And that didn't even happen for Paul, if you recall, as we've already just talked about uh, the, with the road to, on the road to Damascus. But the gospel was being preached by the apostles from the very beginning of the church. And what was carried out from there was the message that the apostles were preaching from such an official capacity as preachers of the Word of God. Concerning the practice of the church on both the corporate and individuals, uh, individual levels, it all starts in the pulpit. Again, it's been very, very popular, especially over the last 30 to 40 years, to de-emphasize the importance of the preaching of the Word of God, the exposition of the Word of God in the pulpit, but to, but to actually try to make things appealing to a lost world as opposed to convicting to a lost world. And the emphasis, again, as I was alluding to earlier, are on things outside of corporate worship service, and the centrality of the preaching of the Word. The emphasis has been very much on children's and youth ministry areas. And in the whole process, what we've done is focused on actually, by practice, separating the families and, and actually creating barriers to the first and primary mission field, which is the home. 
the very first place in which the gospel is to be propagated down from generation to generation. You look throughout the whole of Scripture, Old and New Testament, and, and the primary means of actually perpetuating the gospel message from generation to generation is the homes. And the homes are equipped to do that by the preaching, the clear preaching of the Word of God from a central leadership figure. That's the, that's the pattern, biblically. It's not a back door. And, and too often, for too long, the churches, we've, we've gone to the back. And Jeff Childers was a part of that. I did it. I can tell you. In Acts chapter 2, Peter has just preached the inaugural message at the birth of the church in Jerusalem. And we see there, Acts chapter 2, verses 41 and 42, Luke records, So then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. And they were, they, who's the they now? The church. Were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. So, first and foremost, everything that they did, living out the one another's among one another, started with the preaching of the apostles. And what were they preaching but the word of God? In, in verse 47 of Chap, Acts chapter 2, Luke tells us, and I don't have this up on the slide, but he just tells us that the Lord then was adding to their number daily those who were being saved. This was happening because the people of the church were sharing the gospel. They couldn't keep their mouths shut. So everything that happened daily among the people of the church was stemming from and rooted in and governed by what was being preached at the corporate gatherings of the church by the apostles. And those apostles were not preaching anything but what the Lord had given them, whether it was palatable to the audience or not. In Acts chapter 4, after Peter and John have been arrested for doing just that, for preaching the gospel, and they are in, in Christ's name, they are threatened to stop preaching Christ's message in Christ's name. Peter and John respond there in verses 19 and 20. But Peter and John answered, again Luke's recording this, and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to hear you rather than God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. From there we see the continued emphasis on the priority of the word of God in his church. And not their own word, when circumstances within the church revealed the need for diaconal ministry in order to preserve the ability of the apostles themselves to devote themselves to the ministry of the word in Acts chapter 6. Just following this through, Acts chapter 6 verses 2 through 4 here. So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, It is not pleasing to God for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Not that serving tables was beneath them. But sometimes, as many of you know, sometimes you've got to be able to determine what you can and you can't do. What you ought and you ought not do. Some, all of us have to keep the main thing the main thing in our lives, right? And for, some, for all of us, on levels beyond the word of God and the mission of God in our lives, beyond that, the main thing is the main thing. I'm looking at Kelly here. Kelly works with people, physically helping them. Well, he doesn't need to be working on someone's plumbing when they're needing physical therapy and stuff, right? He needs to maybe turn that over to somebody who, no slight on you, Kelly, but who knows what they're doing. Now, you may be an awesome plumber. I don't know. But if you're like me, it just doesn't turn out well, something that that. Those things don't hook up right. Anyway, it's keeping the main thing. The main thing is different for everybody, but on this, it's the same. What was the result of the apostles making the, the ministry of the word for their lives, their work, their ministry, the priority and the intention? It was the priority and intention of the congregation as well. Look in, in verse 7 of that chapter and the word of God kept spreading. 
not the word of people. The word of God kept spreading, and the number of, dis- of the disciples continued to multiply greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were coming, becoming obedient to the faith. They were sticking to the word. They weren't trying to accommodate people in their lostness. They were trying to declare them their lostness, and only the gospel of God through Jesus Christ from his word does that. In Acts chapter 8, we see that this same church is under heavy persecution at the hand of none other than Paul, who was still known at that time as Saul. And look at what happens in Acts chapter 8, verses 1 to 4. Now, Saul was in hearty agreement with, him, with putting him to death, him being Stephen. They stoned him to death. Saul was basically supervising that. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. But Saul, our Paul, began ravaging the church, entering house after house and dragging off men and women. He was delivering them into prison. Verse 4, therefore... Those who had been scattered went about proclaiming the good news of the word. And in Acts chapter 11, verses 19 to 21, so then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews alone. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, proclaiming the good news of the Lord Jesus, and the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. You see that sequence there, believes and turned, turned evidently calling on the name of the Lord. That is how the church at Antioch came into being. That's what that's talking about here. The very church from which Paul was first sent out on his first missionary journey. God's got a sense of humor. The bottom line significance regarding Paul's use of the word caruso in our focal text this morning for preacher or one preaching, it's actually a participle there, in verse 14, is that it is the word of God as the word of God that will be disseminated throughout the world that will have all, by, by church members, Christians who are not pastors or elders in a church, preachers from a pulpit within a church. It's the Word of God through them that will be dis- disseminated, but it will be disseminated throughout the world through those people because it was first preached officially in a pulpit of sorts, from a preacher of the Word of God, the Word of God. So while the gospel message being proclaimed is not restricted to a preacher preaching in a pulpit of sorts, as I've said, within the context of Scripture, the proclamation of what the message of the gospel is, is restricted to the church of Jesus Christ as ordered by the Lord himself when he gave us the offices to place in the church for leadership. And the message proclaimed will be that which accords again with God's revealed word. Nothing more and nothing less. We must trust God at that and with that. And this is precisely the point of verse 17. Look in our text Back in Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says, So faith comes from hearing, and hearing what? By the word of Christ. We cannot dilute or change the word of God for the sake of a lost world and call that following the pattern of Scripture given to us right here in this passage. When when we're looking at mission efforts over the last 30 years, I have seen, and as I said a moment ago, even participated and organized a great deal of so-called missionary work that does not comport with the scriptural model we see. So much today is actually in the local church focused on the ones going instead of the ones they're going to. 
I have heard, and again, unfortunately, personally promoted missions in the same way my own self in the past in order to get people to go. Like we, we see a need. It's being communicated to us. There's a need. We try to rally people up. And one of the things, one of the promoting points is this, this, will, this will change your life. You, you will go and you will never be the same when you come back. Well, don't go. On. That's true. There's no doubt that if someone goes on a missionary trip, particularly if you go outside the United States and you see the poverty that other people live in and you see them actually living in it and and, and the fact that when you get outside of our borders, even still to this day, whatever the Americans say, people are willing to hear. Whether, they're, whether they will embrace it or not, you've got open ears. And it's, it's really easy in so many cases, in so many, where there's the freedom to do that. Other places, you've got to be more covert. But most of the time, these short-term mission trips, they're not going into those really hard places. They're going into the more open places. And so people, you are, gonna, you, you are going to be changed. But that's not the focus. What do we see in the Bible? In Acts chapter 13, look, I'm putting these up on the screen, but it's okay if you turn pages and you, you're looking and seeing this in your own Bible. It's okay. In Acts chapter 13, verse, verses 1 to 4 there, Luke writes, Now there were at Antioch in the church that was there, Prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean, who had been brought up in, with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, our Paul. And while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, now I want to say this right here, uh, this ministering, this is, this is a form of latruo, uh, and uh, it, it was the highest form of worship. It's, 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 it's worshiping God, devoting oneself to God, also in service. This is the kind of worship that was always attributed in the Old Testament to the priests offering sa sacrifices on behalf of themselves or the people uh, before God. All of that, all of what went, went with that. So this is, this is the picture of what's up. So while they were ministering in that way to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart from me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and they sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia and from there they sailed to Cyprus. This leads us into our text, into what is being said in verse 15, where he says in verse 15 of chapter, Romans chapter 10, and how will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who proclaim good news of good things. Notice that in Acts chapter 13, in that passage, that there are five men that are listed there. There are five men that are listed being prophets and teachers serving in that church at Antioch, but that only two of them are chosen by the Holy Spirit to be sent out. This flies directly in the face of all those. And I heard this one time with my own ears, saw him saying it with my own eyes. Putting this off on really about 1,500 youth and, and adult youth workers at a, at a youth conference, a camp. And he was saying there, he said directly from the pulpit, Rena, you were there. If you don't have an active passport, you are not living out faithful Christianity. How much sense does that make? Look, if everybody here in this church here today is gone out everywhere else, where are we? Not here. Two out of five that are named are chosen to be sent. Not all five. This, 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 this was not some campaign in the church to see how many they could get to go. It wasn't, it wasn't anything like that, especially how many they could get to go do elsewhere what they're not doing here. These men were already doing in Antioch what the Holy Spirit was sending them out to do elsewhere, not the other way around. And we have to keep this in mind when we got, we're thinking about missions. Notice also that there are two times in our English text that we have the word sent. But there are two different words. The first one speaks of the church sending them. And the second one 
speaks of the Holy Spirit sending them. The word translated as sent by the church is from the word apoluo, and the word translated as sent by the Holy Spirit in the next is from ep- ekpempo. It's kind of a funny word, ekpempo. Apoluo carries more of the meaning of releasing, letting go, whereas ekpempo actually means to send forth, to send one from, out from, away from. So the church in reality, was releasing from themselves the two men that the Holy Spirit had authoritatively sent. And what did these men do who were sent by the Holy Spirit and obediently released by the church to go do? In, in, in Acts chapter 13, verse 5, it says, And when they reached Salamis, they began to proclaim the word of God. Don't gloss over that. The word of God is what they were proclaiming in the synagogues of the Jews. And they also had John as their helper. This is just one, another little side note on missions. It's, it's, it's okay to send helpers. John, John was not one chosen by the Holy Spirit to go preach the gospel. John was sent with them as enabling them to go and preach the gospel. But the preaching of the gospel, the proclamation of the gospel was the was the focus. It was the whole purpose of them going. Again, it wasn't going to go dig wells. It wasn't going to go build buildings. Though those may may be a means through which you are able to preach and proclaim the gospel, but that's not the primary thing. It's not the main thing. Listen, church, we, we don't have to come up with something new. I'm just telling you. In fact, by the tender and explicit command of the Scriptures, we are from forbidden from coming up with something new. And when we simply avail ourselves to the privilege the privilege of being used by God to bring His Word to lost people around us. The Lord Himself in His own Word here declares this to be beautiful. Look in our text, Romans chapter 10, verse 15, and how will they preach unless they are sent just as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who proclaim good news of good times. Look, He's not really talking about their feet are beautiful. I mean, my feet... They've been abused. They ain't beautiful. I'm just telling you, it's an ugly sight. He's talking about our presence, the availability, the usefulness to God that we are when we avail ourselves to bring this gospel message to lost people. And it's a privilege. I don't, I don't know about you, but that really, that really reaches inside my chest, grabs hold of my heart, and says, I, I want my God I want my Lord, my Savior, Jesus Christ, my King, my General. I want Him I want Him feeling this way toward me. It kind of overrides what other people think, doesn't it? But for those who receive this gospel, listen to me and I'll say this. For those, for those peers of mine at East Central High School, that were so persistent about me coming to Wade Baptist Church back in 1980, 81. I will eternally no matter where they are or what they're living right now, I will eternally be indebted to them. I will love them for what they did in hounding me to come to that church so that God would have me where he wanted me to work in my heart to bring me to that point on that Friday night, March the 15th, 1981. That I would surrender everything over to him at that moment. I don't even know if some of them still have feet, but I'm telling you, they're beautiful to me. Anyone in here who truly knows Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, going back, and you may not even remember the names of the people that God used, but you remember them, and you'll never get over them. You will never get over them. 
the proclamation by us, God's people, His church, of the gospel to those who do not know the Lord is necessitated by the sovereign decree of God to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to the world. People, we've got to know Christian evangelism is a divine necessity and an amazing privilege that we have been given. And it is such a privilege to be used by Him to do so. If you're here this morning and you haven't experienced what I just, I just shared about my own experience of truly coming to faith in Christ, giving up playing the plastic Jesus game, where I only pull him out when he was convenient to me. Otherwise, I was living like a hellion. But claiming to be a Christian, maybe that's you. Maybe you've never claimed to be a Christian. But if you know beyond any shadow of a doubt this morning that if you died today, you, you can't say, I know beyond any shadow of a doubt that I would be eternally communing with my God in heaven. Then don't, don't leave today. Don't, don't not surrender everything today. I'm telling you, I am telling you, there's nothing, there's nothing in your life worth holding on to that's worth an eternity in hell. And if you have come to that point and you haven't followed through with baptism, you need to follow through with that. On either of those cases, either one of those, I'm challenging you, I'm opening up, I'm inviting you. Grab one of us before you leave here today and say, I, I want to know Jesus Christ as my Savior. I want to surrender everything. I want to I be absolutely devoted to Him for the rest of my life, for all of eternity. Grab one of us. If you, haven't, if you know you have come to trust Him to save you through what He did on that cross 2,000 years ago, having lived a perfect life that we can't live, having having nailed your sins to the cross, paying the debt on our behalf, satisfying the wrath of the Father on His own self for us, going into that grave and coming out of that grave alive on the third day. If you've, if you've put your trust in that for your salvation, receiving the righteousness of Christ because He took your sins and transferred them to Himself, if you've done that but you haven't followed through in obedience to declare openly through baptism the picture of death, burial, and resurrection, the death and burial of our own selves to being raised to new life in Christ, showing our identification with Him in His own death and burial and resurrection. Why not? Why not? We need to follow through. I'm inviting you to make both of those done deals today with one of us, with one of us. Church, let us pray to God to set our hearts on fire with a passion to see the law set. Let's pray. God, we are asking that you do just that. Lord, that you, again, we want to see more people, you doing in more people in our own midst, what you've done in us. God, we're asking that you would, you would, you would work this work even through us of, of bringing this good news, penetrating our culture, our state, our nation, our world even, with this transforming gospel. And Lord God, for those in our midst that have not yet come to that point of trusting you as Savior, Lord, I pray that you're stirring them up in such a way of belief this very morning they cannot help but, con but confess, I am believing in Jesus Christ as God the Son. I am confessing my guilt before Him. I know I am a sinner, utterly lost without Him. And I'm putting my trust in Him this very day. God, I pray that way.
will be experienced by us, your church. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Nate, if you would, brother, come and lead us in our Lord's Supper.